We are here on behalf of Amudim Unite to Heal, a day where Amudim is going to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions of dollars, but the truth is that's up to you. So please head over to unitetoheal.com and help Amudim keep doing the amazing work that they've been doing and enjoy the rest of our program. Many Jewish singers are synonymous with great songs, amazing performances, and great recordings. But the people behind those singers, the people who make the magic happen, who have the talent and the know-how, that list is definitely a lot smaller. Today, thanks to Amudim, we are here with Yisrael Lam, Ding, my good friend, and Shia Mendelowitz, um, David Nachman Golding, I'm sorry, I want to I give you by, by your, your legal name. Either one is fine. Three individuals whose names is synonymous with Jewish music milestones. I'm Yossi Zweig, and this is Off the Charts. Now, Yisrael Lam, I promised a fan of yours that I'd ask this question. You, your brothers, Yitz and Michal, were part of Stei Chemed and and Reveli Tarabam's Pirche Orchestra. Correct. Um, you were known as a trumpet player right. on volume two, but on volume three you were playing both trumpet and trombone. I was dabbling with trombone at the time, right. But on the credit uh, for the album, you had a credit for brass, but if people look closely at that record jacket, not album, this wasn't a CD, um, we noticed that you made the painting that graced the cover. So what was it that got you more attention at the time? Was it the fact that you had a brass credit, or was it the fact that you made the painting that graced the cover? It was the painting that graced the cover. At that time, that's really what I was doing. I was doing more painting than playing. I was just starting to play then, but I was painting for a while. How did you get into painting? I, di I didn't even know you painted. Uh, I don't know. I was two when I started. <laughs> So I don't remember. So this is this is like a, a hidden talent yeah. that I guess as you, a kid, that's I guess what Ding I and Shia probably know about, but I didn't. But you yeah. didn't try another painting for a cover until Ruach one. You know, like yeah, those took were a draw drawings. Uh, this was a painting. It took uh, no. So a then long Regesh, time. Regesh one and two, mm -hmm. those were, were his covers. I, I'm, I'm learning things. things yeah. yeah. Wow. You saw? You still painting nowadays? No, she is trying to get me to get back into yeah. it, but... Uh, well, you just told uh, me you're not on the bandstand every other night anymore. So, I mean, if you have free time, this is what you're supposed to do in your golden years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm being maybe advised my, that. My living room could use an electrical. <laughs> my living room would come first. <laughs> yeah. Now, based on uh, Bailey Teitelbaum's information and Ding's articles in Mishpacha magazine, we know that the band then had a lot of hearts. But my question was, you guys were in like one of the be better studios that time recording it. Um, were you guys like just trying to do the best you can and flying by the seat of your pants or did you guys like rehearse for like a month straight and say okay we're going into the studio we have to know this stuff like without charts we have to know it good and you just rehearsed like crazy you're talking about the Pirche albums, Pirche albums yes. well what happened then was uh, the Epstein brothers were playing they were the band mm -hmm. and the, we, we were in awe of them and Eli invited us down to the studio and uh, he said bring your trumpet down bring your saxophone down and uh, you know, we were like in awe of the Epstein brothers. And <coughs> Ailey said, go join them. So, our, <coughs> excuse me, I remember there was a song, Kiva Simcha, Kiva Simcha, say, say. And me and Mukhu made up something. Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. And we did it. And the Epstein brothers looks at us and they say, wow. You know, and Ailey <laughs> said, you know. <laughs> So that was the contribution. I don't think they had this then back then. That's something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Staying in the Reb Eli Teitelbaum genre, let's go to Shia, who of course uh, wasn't, you weren't just a student of his in yeshiva back in the day in Tarvadas, which is now Tar Um But I've heard some really interesting stuff about you. I mean, you were what, in fourth or fifth grade? You were an, you were an 11th grade boy. And all of a sudden, uh, Reb Eli is having you, your name as producing, uh, producing credits, and you're, you're working on, on dinners, and you're working on Jep One. Uh, you know, people are like, you know, you even had a, a group back then, the Shira Shirim Singers, you're what? So uh, you're, you were jumping all over, but what happened was, first of all, Eli was my, was my second grade Rebbe, and um, that was the year that he, he opened up Camp Stay Chemet. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just the thought of that as for a kid to, to be able to, the thought of even going to Israel, like it was, it was a dream. But before that, let's go back before that, I, I used, anything that came out in, in Jewish music, which was very little, but I knew every record cover and listened to everything that was available. Shia, when he was in diapers, I'm telling you, he, he, 
Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sheet, we all play a game with Chia, he goes, you just make, give him the name of a song, he'll tell you, not only will he tell you what album it came on, he'll tell you what side of the album and what number on that side of right. the album. You just have to Test give him the out. first note, just right. the first right. note. Right, but eight tracks you ever have named that two or two. three tracks per side, so it's a uh, No, on the record, on the way we started with no, the record. No, no, I used to know, I used to know the orders of, of the songs. I, you know, I wish I could have done that with, you know, Gamora and stuff like that, that would have been. In any case, so Ailey Teitelbaum um, was my Rebbe. He actually suggested to Avram, I'm, I'm going fast yeah, forward. Yeah, you are going fast. Yeah, he asked me to, uh, he told Avram to call me because Avram was interested in singing solos on albums, but not, he didn't, not never wanted to be, right. he didn't want to be Avram Fried or anything. that. That's a whole story in itself, but um, Ailey was the, the pioneer for, uh, for all these things. He was the guy who, for all of us, he had a shaykhus to, to all of us to, to start on things, right? He, well, his brother was the one who started you, right, Surly? Surly, yeah. I started playing Surly's trumpet. Yeah. Now, what was it like when you're a bucker and he lets you use his studio to work on a Mudejesh, the wedding album? So he, he decided he's going to make a studio in his basement. And at the same time already he had he had made dial a duff, you know? Right. That was that was there genius. in the basement. Huh? It's genius. Yeah. And he made that uh, so I, I, I at that time I had um the Amude Sheish Orchestra. And um, and I I did it for the first album and I wanted that's when Avramo sent me a song as a demo and I just I loved what I heard with him so I called uh, Suki Suki Berry and he, he he gave me three songs to choose from I, I was looking for something new right and Aruka that was the first song I wanted to try to do something totally independent you know right and so that that was the uh, no jewel be left behind album but then, uh, but those albums were very different because the first thing with your, your Mude Sheish wedding album you recorded in Elie Tadabam's yeah. basement studio. Yeah. And for No Jew, you went to Gadi Bodinger's uh, one bedroom apartment. Yeah. Somehow it first started off as from the houses, right? You know, the studio. Can I ask so, you a trivia question? Sure. Since we're talking about Yisrael and Elie Tadabam, Shalom, what song did they both compose together? Vinny Casey. Oh. And that yeah, was, Vinny Casey was on the first Day Chemet album. And when I heard that, that song, I, I didn't know who he was, Abramo. Right. But I loved what I heard in his voice, the way he sang that as first part. Yeah, yeah, as a kid. Yeah. So you're in Gotti Bodinger's basement. And no, Gotti Bodinger's apartment. His apartment on the Upper West Side, yes. which is where we're going to get to you in a minute. Right. Um, and you're there, it's you, Avram Fried, and Marty Lee Winter. Now. Is there any time when you're recording this, you're like, I hope this works, or like, we hope this goes well, or you guys were fairly confident that you can do what you, no. what you set out to come. So we recorded the rhythm tracks. So that, you know, that's how we did it in later years. We started first the rhythm, mm -hmm. um, and then the brass section, and, and then strings. And uh, so I, when I recorded, so I did the, the the rhythm tracks over there at Bagadi. Then Mordechai ben David came into, into this picture at that time. And he said, why don't you go record the strings and the brass in Israel? It's much cheaper. Okay. So we did that, and I brought the music back, and Avramel comes to the, I, to the studio to start the first day of singing. And I, I, uh, Gotti puts on the, the music for uh, Kel Dice and he knows where I'm, he's supposed to sing. He, he knew the, you know... Nowadays you'd have a guide, but over there you have right. to know where to, put, where, to go, where to start. And every time it, we, <laughs> we had the intro, he listened to the whole thing and he just froze. He was nervous, so that, that session didn't work out too well. When He's, I interviewed him a few years ago, he, he said at the beginning he, he was a green. No, he said I'm a green. I was a greener. Like I, I yeah. but I never. So Avram Fried froze. Yeah, he froze for that and for that whole session. That was it. 
And then, yeah, so then after that, he got used to it, and um, the rest is history. S yeah. Since we're talking about Gotti Bodinger, who lived on the Upper West Side, let's go to you, Ding. Okay. Now, your two first projects could have been more different than anything. Over here, we have a wedding album that was very unique and different. Right. So keep it a touch of Ding. And right. on the other side, we have Uncle Maishi, which is now has his third decade of fans. You know, we're talking about probably a uh, quarter of a century worth of fans are still listening and going nuts about his albums. Right. And both of them recorded also in very different studios. Um, correct. One was recorded by, I think one was recorded by Gotti or not? The, the Uncle Maestro was recorded Uncle Maestro by was Gotti. Recorded by Gotti and and the other one was in, in Sound Ideas. Sound Ideas. Man. Which was the first digital studio in New York. Oh, digital, yeah. What happened with the first, my first album, Sookie with Touch of Ding, mm -hmm. was a music album. And I met Sookie on Pesach of 1977. I went with him to Camp Aguda of Toronto and we became close friends. And on the way, when camp was over, he told me that he was going to Israel that Thursday. And we came back from camp, it was like on a Sunday night, and he said, We're, uh, he's going to Israel on Thursday. I said, let's make a record. He says, how could we make a record in, in two days? Right. So I said, we'll make it a wedding album. It'll be just music and, and we'll, we'll do it. We'll record it one day and we'll mix it and that put it together. And, and, and but this the is the first day. time you're doing this. Right, this is the first time we're Did doing it. I had a little experience because my brother, Suki had a lot of experience and I had a little experience because my brother made the Jep albums. Right. So um, we went ahead, we went into a studio, we recorded the entire uh, album in one, in one shot, maybe five, six hours. And then uh, we came back the next day and we mixed it and we put it together. And that night I was going back to Camp Corina and I was driving with my brother, and my brother said, what are you going to name the album? Your brother Yisachayim? Yisachayim, Yisachayim. He said, what are you going to name the album? Mm -hmm. So I was we were thinking, I remember it was raining, we were thinking about it, and, and then I came up, how about Suki with a touch of ding? And, and that was that. So what happened was, is that I, 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 we, did, <laughs> we did the first music album, yeah. and, and Suki went to Israel that Thursday, and, I, and then a week later uh, we were scheduled to, I, was, I started teaching in Lubavitch, and then all of a sudden, what like... What did you teach? Fourth grade English. What? You really? meant subject yeah. English. You know who was in my class? No. One of my... Uh, uh, Rabashkin. What? Yep. So then one day, after teaching for about two months, Yehuda Spinner comes back from Israel and says, you really have to, you have to come to Itri and learn in Itri. I said, I'm teaching here, and I'm teaching, I'm making a living. And he says, no, no, no. And I go home that night, and the phone rings, and who is it? It's uh, Sal Tischler. He tells me I have a check for you, from my first check from Sookie Sookie with a touch, touch of ding. ding. So I figured, okay, how much is it? Is the cover? And I, he, I come and pick up the check and I open it and I look at it in my eyes. I, whatever I was expecting, it was like 10 times Wait, more. So how old were you at this point? I was 20. That's how much size? Right. Single. Right. Yeah, single. 20. And, and so I, t I, I left. As soon as I left, I said to myself, I can't, I'm not going to stay here in, 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 in America. I have money. I, mean, I can I afford a plane money. ticket now. And the next night, I went with you to the spinner. We flew to Israel. I went, I went there. So that's where I met. That's where we got together with Suki in the same year. And that led to the whole Vachom Aminim story with the, that Pesach with Mordechai ben David, mm -hmm. which, I wrote, a, about, which I wrote about in Mishpach magazine. Right. Was a, a couple of days before poor Mordechai ben David came to do a concert. And we just went to visit him. And the whole idea of Vachom Aminim came up. And he said yes, and that's how the whole you guys were like, "Oh, we can record albums in two days." And he's like, "Yeah, let's let's just try to do that." And that yeah. that was the legacy it was always two days. And then, well, uh, was, uh, well we tried. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we did one in one day. Uh, right, right. Yankee Stewart on his country rock, and we yeah, actually yeah. did. But then what happened was, so then I went back to I went back to the people listening to the albums thirty years later. I was like, yeah, we did it in one day. We just yeah, we had nineteen an hours straight without stopping. We wow. did the Yankee Stewart from from the first note. Until the, until the final mix. Mm -hmm. And then, so then I went back to, to Itri, and that's when the Uncle Moishi thing came up with the, that, that year. So I, was, I met Zale Newman. Wait, wait, what, what was there for children to listen to there was, in, in there those was, years? There was uh, Ask Yisrael, because he did, you, we, you did 613 Torah right. Avenue, and uh, there was the Mitzvah Tree. But this was, I think, the first children's album. Uncle Moishi was the first children's album that the singers were adults as opposed to children. the other ones which were children, right? But you felt there was a need for that, I'm assuming, at that time? I, I felt that it would, be, it would be clearer for kids would feel closer to hearing an adult sing like a Rebbe than actually hearing like another being kid. being taught by somebody who's... Right. 
Uh, and how did you and uh, so I met Zale? I met Zale at an NCSY Shabbaton on, on, on Pesach. And it also, that same year, coming here, that coming Pesach, I was doing, a, I had already planned to do a Toronto Boys Choir album, volume three. All in my one Pesach. And, uh, that's why Pesach was So that's why it way. worked out great, because Zale lived in Toronto, and the singers were in Toronto, so that was it. Now, the one thing about you, different than the other two, is I, I feel I have more, a lot of difference between I have me more of a connection than you, because let's be honest, she yeah. was a drummer, Avramo's first drummer. Right. Yisrael, well, we know what Yisrael can do. Right. But you, you're right. not musically inclined, right. meaning you don't play anything. Basically, right. So the, the relationship between you and, and, and Suki is, is, you know, I mean... It's like, what, what, what you're really asking is like, yes. uh, I once went on a date and I was single, and the girl says, you play an instrument? Because if you sing, I go like that. Well, I thought you were talented, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I can't sing, I can't play, but I can produce an album in right. two days. If you give, give me a date in three days from now, I'll have a new album for you to listen to. Two days, three days. But when it says produced by Suki and Ding, so right. Suki's doing the arrangements. Right. So Ding Actually, does, the truth when is... When people say Ding does everything else, what is everything else? You sit there and you, you, you pick the songs, you pick the singers. Well, she could tell you, because he does pretty much the same thing. We, we, when you, first, you have to pick a, an artist to mm -hmm. sing the song, and then you have to pick the, the songs, and you have to pick the style of the music. In my case, most of my albums had a theme to it. We also... It, 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 it was the, the way you advertise the product, and... and, and just coming up with different ideas to keep it fresh and to keep it to keep it different. Really, the producer is the one that sets the whole tone, the whole concept of the whole album, and and uh, arrangers and singers, and everybody else is really asking the producer, "What do I do?" That's you know that's he's really the man at the top. Right. He's going to be the man with the vision, the man who yeah. has the contacts to get everybody together to do well, the good parts. Well, it, it's it's also that like Shia like. When, when he's in a studio with, with Avon Freed, so he decides whether or not it's a good take or not a good take. Now, can I frame will do it? He could do it, but that... Does he have to be pushed to do the right version of it? And so... Go it, higher here, go lower there, yeah. do it differently. No, I see so. him, I say, no, I want the drummer to do like this, and I want the trombone player to go, go mm -hmm. like that. And the, 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 you can be very talented musically without playing an instrument. But then when it's finished, you have this whole thing called mixing, which means you go into a studio, you, the producer, and the engineer, and you put each instrument gets a certain level of, of, of the, uh, gets a certain, um, what's the name, uh, with, uh, tone, whatever it's called. You uh, want to make sure one's not overpowering the other, they work yeah, but also, you know, also, also what it sounds like. What it's, right. You know, right. Just more echo, less echo, that could be so crucial in how the right. singer's voice sounds. On top, how much echo, you could, you could, have two, one song and, and have two engineers mix it and it will sound completely different. A producer basically... They always have, say singers that are songwriters have a better vision because they created the song so they know. But you know, if you're a singer and you're going to different composers, you're sitting with them, you'll, you'll take a song because you like it or you think people will like it, but you still really don't have a final vision. So you need a producer to guide you, kind of right. to tell you, well, if you do this and this to the song, it'll make it so much more better. You know, and especially in the days of U2 and you, um, when Alfred Fried, Morah Hamid, when all these albums, even Daddy's, when, the, when these albums were coming out, a lot of the intros written by the arrangers became integral parts of the songs in the oh, 70s and 80s. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, and not only you that. You don't really have that today anymore. You right. know, the intro is a very small no, part of the song. Not only that, you, before she or I came around, Yisrael, who was just the arranger, actually took the role of becoming a producer because in all those albums, like you went into 613 Horror Avenue, they didn't know, they didn't really know what to do. They were, we were relying on your throat to whether or not the, you know, whether the mix is okay, whether the singing is okay. I mean, you must have done yeah, it with but many. Yeah, what do you think I went to many be a producer? <laughs> from the producers. <laughs> now, Yisrael, this must, must be very different from you nowadays to when you started out. Did you really have to write every arrangement out on paper by hand? Every little note on it, you had to do it like that, Mama. Yeah. Yeah. And nowadays you have digital components, you can play it out in the computer. And well, print in it in out. those days, I used to write the master score by hand. So after I had the master score, I used to write, look at the master score and write the individual parts for each musician. Which is called copying. Copying. And she has said to me, what, what is this crazy? What are you doing this for? Yeah, I told him. I said, this is nuts. 
What is a master score for, though? The master score That's is the master arrangement. Of every instrument there. You see other. all the instruments on yeah. a sheet of paper. So whoever's looking at it could see or read what exactly what okay, is, what's fine. going on. That's what I was trying to understand. But when you go into the studio or at a concert, musicians, individual musicians, don't need to know what's going on. They just need to know their, their part. part. Right. Yeah. So that's called the copying part. Basically, they're taking the, the, the music sheets and they're playing what's Playing playing. it, and they have no idea what they're playing, they're playing. And then so you, you never used to give it to them prior to trying never, to learn the no. part? Not, they not, not, they didn't need it. Right. So it's not because you felt it was magic if they played it the first time by reading it. You just, no, that's, what you, that's what they were paid for. That's what that's, they were expected to do. And that's what they did for a living, these musicians. They're called studio musicians. So when, when you're writing an arrangement, Yisrael, how do you do it? Meaning, oh. what, what instrument are you using to try to figure out what you want to go where? Okay, today, we're using computers. No, but not today. Go and back then, to the beginning, yeah. Yeah, it was the same thing. You're, you you were learning trumpet. That was okay, your first so instrument. Okay, so you had a piece of paper that had score lines on it, and uh, you vision in your mind what so you, you want the arrangement to sign. So you never played it out on a guitar, piano, no. or asked anybody to do anything for you? No, no. You hear it in your mind, and then you write it. I mean, just like you're, you're writing a composition, you're writing yeah. a speech. You hear the speech in your mind, and you write it. It's no big deal. So... What, you know, when, when I'm writing one speech, yeah. When I'm running one speech with 15 par harmonies and other instruments, yeah. It's, 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 it's a chokhmah. It's not that's a different language. Yeah. That's, but it's, 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 Music it's a, is a language. Saying, it's a language. Right. And the writing is a language. The only thing that maybe is a little tricky is if you're writing a speech of 30 people talking at the same time, right. and each one is saying a lot of different things, that's a little hard to, to imagine. But that's what you're doing when you're writing an orchestration. You're trying to imagine what... 30, 40, 60 musicians are going to sound like when they play together. So now we have the computer, so you can actually hear what you're doing, yeah. which is better than just trying to imagine what you're doing. Because th there were times when, in my mind, yeah, it sounded pretty good when we went to the studio. <laughs> and there were yeah, times. Like, can you give us an example? No, no, that album never came out. Oh, that album never came out. No, I mean, maybe there was once that you went into the studio and you were like, okay, we're just going to. Take out this instrument and replace it with something else. Yeah, that's there were, happened. There before. were times we went to the studio and it just didn't work. So, what is your favorite arrangement? That you, I mean, you must have you know, hundreds, of hundreds, hundreds, thousands. What is your favorite? Boba Vikela done and the uh, Philharmonic Experience. But 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 originally that originally was done. You did it for Ailey, all of a sudden. Yeah, but then when we did it for yeah. Philharmonic, we on yeah. yeah. Now, Ding, it looks like that your relationship with Suki is like a Yisachar Zvon kind of thing. Well, he is Where, where he, he, ha he has his part, you have her. Have you ever tried your hand to do it right at uh, arranging oh, no. a song or oh, anything? No. <laughs> you don't want that. You want me to? That, that, and he, and there, he, are he, certain, there are certain things, that, you know, just like I, my wife always says, you know, don't try to cook it, right? So it's like, there is a, I don't sing and I don't write music, so uh, that's off the table. Now, we're talking just now about the symphonies and whatnot. Right, so you saw it was 1971 or 72. Uh, you're fresh off two Nagina albums. You're off the Hineni album, the London School Koyamar. And Rebeli says, you know, come in. We're working on Camp Stechem and Sings Volume Two, and uh, I have the Israeli for a harmonic. You know, you'll come in and like this is your first time working with you know what we what we call probably symphony, symphony professional musicians, guys who have practiced and honed their talent. Um, what was it like for you? And did you hear anything from them about how they felt, you know, somebody with your credentials uh, conducting them? Well, look, in Stechemet, I was a kid. And uh, Ailey said, you know, you're going to conduct the symphony. We, I think we had like 35 musicians. You know, it was, a, it was a different time. I really didn't take it that seriously. I looked at it as a great opportunity. Like, like Dick was saying, we were just having a good time. And so there uh, were no nerves at all. Really not. Wow. Ailey said, do it. And mm -hmm. well, you see, the thing was that I really didn't know what I was doing. And when you have the clue what you're doing, you just get up there and just do whatever happens. And if I could take a minute to be technical, yes. I was not born a natural conductor. You know, some people get on a bike and they're just off, and some people, they just never get the balance. I was not born as a natural conductor. So just to get technical a little bit, when a conductor conducts, it's almost like the beat is like when he's banging on a table. It should be one, two, three. So it almost sounds like the beat is on the way up. It almost looks like that. But 
what comes naturally to a lot of people, and to me then the beat starts when you're going down. So it's like one instead of one. So it says one, two, three. Right. That's wrong. It should be one, two, three. That's right. So I couldn't like get that right. Thing, right. So I get up there in front of 30 musicians, and they're all looking at me. That, musicians always do that. Who's this conductor? Who does he think he is? You know, right. Right? Right. And I start going one, and they're doing something totally different than it's in my mind. So the whole thing was a disaster. It, it, we pulled it off one way or the other, but it was, it was fun. It was a, a, a learning curve. So let's say 15, 20 years later, right. just like Ailey said to me then, Yisrael, you're going to conduct the symphony orchestra. She has said to me, you're going to go conduct the symphony orchestra in Lincoln Center. Now, by that time, it wasn't a joke anymore. This was a business. But have, yeah. have you, was there any time in between where you did this again? Or no, I was still doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but we, we recorded the album first. Yeah, but I didn't on. conduct it. Yeah. But she has said, This was the first conduct. time of you conducting a symphony right. in 25 years. Right. As a 16-year-old and now as a... Yeah, but now I had to do it right. Right. Then it was a joke. So uh, I went and took conducting lessons, crash conducting lessons, and we pulled it off, you know? Yeah. How do right. you know enough what to do when you were 16, the first time, without any lessons? You, you, there's nothing you have to know how to do? So besides the beat? Sometimes you go to an orchestra, a concert, and you see the conductor shakes hands with the first violinist. The reason for that is because many times everybody's really following the first violinist. The conductor's just up there to make faces. Yeah, and, right. uh, you know. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the truth of the matter is that it's not your personality to do, become more flamboyant, right? Like it, you always like to just... Yeah, but I think now I'm actually conducting. Uh -huh. I still have to shake hands with the first violinist, <laughs> but many times they're watching the first violinist, right. and that's really what we did. Itcha, remember Itcha, yeah, Markowitz? Markowitz. Yeah. He, he really did the conducting, and that's how he got through. You want to know the million dollar question? Yes, thing. He never took a music lesson, is that correct? You never, you never went, you never... I never took formal lessons. Mm -hmm. How do you know about arranging? How do you know? How do you know? Like By listening. That's amazing. That's yeah, really... By listening no. to writing... No, because most scores. musicians that could play by ear, they can't read it. No, they can't read it right, most but, of them. I don't know how he does it. But, but it's like any field. Anybody will tell you, when did you really learn your trade? You know, when after you went out to work, experience. you went out when to you work. You know. it, yeah. Did right. anybody come over to you after the session to congratulate you or say you did a good job? And in, in Israel, by the Philharmonic, or they, they were happy yeah, the day was over and they just wanted to go. No, actually, what, one compliment we got was when the choir, when we were doing rehearsal in the Stechemer dining room, and we would, the song was Lamana Chai, and Eli had the choir there and the orchestra. And I remember the trumpet player saying, oh, sounds like Henry Mancini. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I took that as a real compliment. That was nice, yeah. If he has a real good drive, he gets lunch. Okay, he next question lunch. is yes. for all three of you. I'm starting oh. off with Dingus. Dingus already talking. Sure. Um, oh, what was your, I can't believe I'm here moment. You know, what moment in your career were you doing uh, something, either a show, an album, recording with somebody, where you're like, wow. Like, like, I made it, like, I can't believe that I'm here doing this right now. I, I think the, the moment that Shlomo Kabach came in on the, on the second Hass concert as a surprise to the audience and the roar of the crowd, I mean, I, 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 I said to myself, like, uh, and, and I won't take the credit for it, that it was my idea, you know, like to bring him in as a surprise. Mm -hmm. And just the, the, the like, the, like I said, like, we did it. We did it. Like, we, we successful. We made Hass I think that has became like good forever because of that one moment. From where I stood, mm -hmm. uh, that was the loudest roar ever. I ever heard on stage. At any Hass uh, concert? Any, anywhere. Wow. When Shalom came around. Well, what was the moment for you? Getting up to conduct the Philharmonic Experience at Hask II in Lincoln Center. I'm standing in front of a 60-piece orchestra, just fresh out of the crash conducting course Lessons, that I took. Right. And, uh, you know, did I ever dream that I would be doing this? In the Lincoln Center, I would talk to musicians sometimes, and I would say to them at the time, and I would say, you know, in about two weeks, I'm conducting Lincoln Center. And they'd be, what? You're conducting Lincoln Center? Yeah, I'm conducting Lincoln Center. That's a hobby. Like, wow, you know, how, how, do you say, how do you say that so easily? 
So for me, on the year number one. Yeah. Asked? Yeah, okay. I'm asked. So um, during the day. So. You're talking about rehearsals that at day. At the right? rehearsal yeah. that day, we were, were in, the, in the place getting sound checks and everything. And the theme, I asked the show to write that, that the, oh, the wow. Hess theme. Yeah. And when they played it that day in the, in the, I, I, I was, you I knew broke it. down crying. You I knew broke it. Down crying. You got yeah. shells. When people ask me, where did that come from? It, it took me three seconds to write. What? It's not that yeah. long. You know, it's very no, short. It's not that long. No, but th this may sound like a crazy story, but this is really what happened. I, I, um, I knew, I had a feeling that something new was starting. You know, we were a bunch of yeshiva boys playing weddings and doing little concerts. And we, we were going into Lincoln Center and there was a possibility that something new was happening. And I really thought to myself, and I'm not kidding around, I said, if I was at Bria Seiler, what kind of music would you hear there? And it just came to me, boom, 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 boom. This was the beginning. It just was the right, the right music Yoichi for the right LA. song. It, it yeah. was the right music for the right song, and uh, so you heard the, you heard the the orchestra playing it by rehearsal, but you never heard the orchestra play it in Lincoln Center till that moment. And it must have been the bigness the, of the at moment. that at that point. It all came together. I mean, there were there were a lot of you, you got to understand that 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 first year we were we were just working nonstop. This is how this went very quickly. Yes. When he, when when I went to Hess to sit with with, with Matra and to sing for the kids, I invited my my family that I asked to go. Uh, I wanted to experience Hess. Nothing. They didn't. They weren't t talking about any concert. They had no idea right. of fundraising. And then I I that they they told me they're going to close. They're going to close the camp. Because you can't afford to keep it open anymore because there's a lot of costs. No, yeah, they were cutting, they cut the funding. They cut the government. These, yeah, from, and it was, so I said, you can't do that. And the idea, Hashem put the idea into my head about making a concert. My idea was to do it, a concert at the Felt Forum. I called him, the Ding, I, I told him what I want to do, and he said, no, don't do it in Felt Forum. It was his idea to go into Lincoln Center. And from then, it was nonstop. We were all going nonstop, right? right? And, for, and for and six it months, it was nonstop. But it it was so fun, and it was so like we 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 didn't stop working. But it, it was a we just fun doing it. Like we we had a good fun time. Fun and but there was, an it was nervousness. We were yeah. nervous. We, we were, were little, nervous. We were because nervous. things were were going up and down, uh, up we, and down. The sales the were sales, not. right? Yeah, but also you guys have never at that point have you produced concert like enough concerts to be confident that you know how to put one together? No, because this Even was just a, the program, this, was a, this was a whole new animal. This was there were a lot of complications that that we didn't have in Brooklyn College, like. Uh, De deal first deal, dealing with the unions over there, which is what I've you know, learned a lot about over the right. years between these two and the other. Yeah, things really, you know, had to be right, and but I, I think did they make you shut down an hour before the show too? Because of, of course, yeah. So we bought the you could you could buy the hour. There was another way for them to schlep go. The first time there. we had a meeting, we were all sitting at a round table, a little bigger than this, with Jack Kirkman and Link, and and the guy sitting there with his pad. He goes, "Okay, uh, Ding, uh, who's your LD?" <laughs> I go, Shia, what's an LD? Yeah, yeah. Shia, what you were saying was... <laughs> what is an LD? The lighting director. <laughs> what got to you was, it's happening. As soon yeah. as you heard that music, you realize, you know, yeah. this is happening. Right. Yeah. We've, yeah. It, it's coming together. Yeah. But, but there were a lot of lead-ups lead to, to that moment. The, uh, we were, the week before, we were sold out. We were sold out. You couldn't get a ticket. There was... People were offering crazy money, right? Yeah. And when the concert was, you, this you're going to remember, when the concert was like three quarters, more than three quarters, there was like three songs left to go to the guy. She comes over to me backstage, and he gives me this hug, and he says, we did it, we didn't. Yeah. It. And I said, she, we didn't do it yet. It's not all, we still have three songs, because I'm the, I'm the yeah. and, and then all of a sudden, for the last song, the last song was Forever One, and, and I remember singing it, and, just ripped it apart, and and when as soon as he finished the last note of Forever One, Mordechai ben David and Yoel Shirabi comes out wheeling a child 
a has child on, on a wheelchair. And instantly, 3,000 people just stood up. And then I turned to she and I said, nice. now we did it. Yeah. yeah. Now, speaking of musicians and performers, we're going to name a few performers that are no longer with us and whose absence can never be replaced. I'm sure you guys all have fond memories. But I thought this would be a good space to talk about some stories of people that aren't here. So I'll start off with uh, Yossi Piment. I, I loved him. I love him. He, he was a, a very, very close friend of mine. He was a close friend of Yisrael's and Ding. We all had different kind of relationships with him, but he's, he was unbelievable. The, guy, unbelievable the guy, no matter what time of day it was, would do whatever he can to help another. He went that. through to, to the whole safe till him twice a day. A day. Really? Yeah. The first time I met him was in, when I was doing an album, the Suki would touch a ding number two. And uh, I never I never met him before. And uh, I come to the studio and I'm looking, I said, Where's the the Piemente guy? And then all of a sudden I see a guy who's just sitting there with, with the guitar and he's saying to him. And and but the, the guy went to do a favor, you can call him up. I, uh, this guy there's a wedding tonight, and 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 the husband has just lost a, a, a somebody, and then and, and and he's in a bad mood. And you, you don't have to ask again. He's there. Yes, he was there. Uh, there, there was a time I, I told him about a group of, of of people in Camp Monroe, a camp that's not religious, and uh, how they learned they they were in love with Mordechai and David just when Shabbos. He said, "I'm going. I'm performing with. I'm going down to to Camp Monroe." That's him. That's him. Yeah. What I remember about him is he, he had a simchas achayim that it was rare to see. He, I mean, the biggest bracha somebody could have is to have simchas achayim. Yeah. And he would pistachio nuts, this this kind of drink, you the know, coffee. you mix it, it coffee. The, the, you the, make the coffee, coffee the old the way. End. We brought the, right, the mishinkel right, on, on, on. Yeah, he made yeah. it on jobs on the bandstand. And, and the other thing I learned from him is that we had ideas that, you know, music, Jewish music is a certain thing. Yeah. Yeah, you can go a little bit this way, a little bit that way, and people yeah, draw, angry draw when, the line, so when, you, when you made it a little bit too jazzy or whatever. And he came from a totally different world and, and made, made Jewish music, made it into Jewish music. I remember the first time that I met, how did I meet Jesse P. You were in California. In California. Uh, Nagina was hired to do a concert in San Diego. Uh, Yossi Piamenta was the opening act. I forgot who we, who was singing with us. Maybe it was, I, I forgot. Marco but he was there, right? I think so, maybe. Yeah. And Yossi Piamenta would call me up on the phone and uh, in his very colorful way, tell me, where are you going to do this? You're going <laughs> to hear something you never heard before. And I'm, you know, who's this guy? And we never got together. But we met in California, and I walked into the concert hall with carrying my bag of music while he was rehearsing. And I heard he was doing mitzvah, goreh, and mitzvah, you know, with his band. I never heard anything like this. I was just totally blown away. And I said to myself, Lamb, Jewish music is not going to be the same anymore. And it was true. I've also heard in the last few years there's a lot of musicians that passed away that were part of the Jewish music scene when you guys were on it. That I names I didn't even know. Who? About. I'm trying to think right now. Larry Gates. Label Heschel. Larry. Larry Gates. Label Heschel. Label Heschel. Label Heschel. He was many years already. Label Heschel. Shlomo Kalbach. Shlomo Kalbach. Yossi. Moshe Yes. Shalom Levine. Uh, La you bring up Larry Gates, and everyone knows. Mo Larry most Gates people know Larry Gates. The fifth night of Hanukkah. Know Larry Gates as, as, as the, an engineer. The studio guy is an engineer, but Larry's done a lot of voices for Uncle Mason. He's done a lot of other for everything. He did, yeah. He adds vocals, and you don't even know he doesn't even get credit on a lot of the albums. And, and it, he he never disappointed you. When you took the microphone, you knew that that he'll do the job that you want him to do. And it, uh, he was even more than that when Larry was there. That's it. Larry's going to take care of it. That's it. No worries. When you went to the studio, you yeah. knew you were coming back with a product when, when Larry was there. Uh, of course, also, I mean, just in the last year, when we lost the uh, Shmuel Burger. Sammy. Yeah. He did. He did it. You did, you did some He did the double album, yeah. Yeah, for Sammy and Fischier, right? Yeah. Yeah. But Achrein Achrein obviously, is Rav Shlomo Kalbach, who you guys both, all, all three of you have worked with over your time uh, of music. Shlomo was very different than what most people 
right? Uh, everybody in the world. You're saying like, when, you, when you hear him, when you hear about him, and when you know him, they're very different personas. Very, very different. First How of so? all, uh, I think the biggest thing was that you know people always say he was and he was like uh, like out of it. He knew everything that was going on. He knew. Uh, he, he knew, uh, you could ask him like seven years after, eight to ten years after a concert, what musician played with you that night, and he'll know, even though that night when he was playing with you, he kept on mixing up his guy's name and stuff like that, but he, he, he knew exactly what was going on, and, and people used to make fun of him, you know, sometimes, and, and uh, you know, and... Uh, he knew that they were making fun of him. They used to they, say they, he was always on something. But the greatest, he really wasn't. The greatest story she will tell you, and if we were all there backstage at the Hats concert, she, you tell the story. Somebody came over to him in the middle of the, in the middle, we were backstage, and somebody came over and said, "Shlomo, why do you, why does so much, so much, so many of your songs sound sound alike?" And he down what he said. He said, "Everybody." No, he yes. didn't answer the guy. He didn't answer. When the guy left, we, were, we I think me, Matra, uh, you saw. Uh, he, he said, Every, "Everybody is, steals songs from me. I could steal from myself." <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was talking to Matra a few years ago, and he said the only place that he performed first before Shlomo Kabach was Australia. That's a what? what, what the what? one place that Mordechai and David performed before Shlomo Kabach was Australia. Uh -huh. Shlomo Kabach got to Australia a few months later and uh, he said we saw Matra at the Hess concert a, few, uh, a little while later. He went like this to him. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I got to Australia. They asked me why, 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 why I'm why singing I sing. your songs. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> so he goes, Matra goes, ah, Kodesh, uh, it was a present from Akadosh Baruch this song. What are you complaining about? And Shlomo Kabach goes, yeah, but he gave it to me. He didn't give it to you. Right. That's true. And the other story was uh, in La Vista Hotel. Um, me and Sufi were in La Vista Hotel, and he said, I don't know if you know this story, it's a great story. So he, he, I said, Shlomo, you have any good songs? He says, yeah, bring a tape recorder. I said, I'll be back in five minutes. And then I come out, I have a tape recorder. In those days, we had tape recorder, we didn't have phones. Right. And he goes, just before I, 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 I sing you this song, he goes, I have one complaint. He goes, I said, what's the complaint? He says, you took Aisha Shayo, and you gave it to Avram Fried, and he did a very good job on it. But I composed it slow, and you went ahead and made it into a fast song. I composed it for my chuppah, for my old chuppah. So, so he looked at him and said, Shlomo, the, the marriage didn't, wasn't, didn't last that long. <laughs> and the only time in my life I heard him, like, Shlomo just cracked up. He goes, you know, you're 100% right. <laughs> Brother. Brother. But he was the most popular guy, most popular guy in the world in Jewish music. And he was not in the business. He wasn't, he, right? Yeah, he just, uh, it was all here. It was all yeah. in his heart. Yeah, all. Whatever yeah, money he made, they say he gave away. Yeah, yeah. and he was a big, uh, he gets a doctor, and he, it's just amazing. I mean, he once invited me to one of his Gemara Shir, Shirim, and that wasn't the Shlomo that I knew. Right. So he was, you, was you like went? listening to a Rosh Yeshiva. It was Klar, it was. Uh, yeah. It was an act, all this stuff. Was it was all an act. It was, it was all, all an, act. an act. The Holy Brother. The famous story that's written up in the book was that uh, Maisha Yes broke his leg a couple of days before, like Boma. Mm -hmm. And they, in Mont he was scheduled to do a concert in Montreal, and they didn't have anybody. So Maisha Yes called up Shlomo and said, uh, Can you replace me? Are you busy? He says, I'm available. How much are you paying? So uh, Maisha yes said, no, so the Chabad rabbi was going, the Chabad said, says, look, we don't have a very big budget, but whatever comes in that night, I'm going to, whatever comes in at the house, it goes completely to you. So um, they had a concert, a lot of people showed up at the door, it was a great concert, and at the end of the, con and at the, end of the concert, the Chabad rabbi comes over, he gives him a chunk of cash, and he puts it into his pocket, and about 10, 15 minutes later, after the concert, people were coming over to say, you know, Shkayach to, to Shlomo, and a couple came and told him, um, we just got married a couple of weeks ago, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of money, and he was, they were pulling out their hearts, and maybe you can do something, whatever. Shlomo never looked at how much money was in the pocket, he just put his hand into his pocket, pulled it out, and gave it to them. Before we leave, Big Lamb. That's me. Where, where's this from? Where's, where's the Big Lamb? Because oh. Michal and Yitzchak, they were... 
uh, that's how we differentiated between ourselves. I was big lamb, Michal was middle lamb, and Yitzhak was little no, lamb. No, Michal was cook. No, but when it, we started, oh. I don't know, for some reason people called us lamb. It's, it's very easy to say, just say, hey, lamb, lamb, lamb. So there are three lambs, a big lamb, middle lamb, a little lamb. We were all about the same size. But, uh, but you're the oldest, you're saying, that's yeah. pretty much it. You saw it had and a little ding, lamb. I guess ding is just shorter than golding. Yeah, my no, it's actually not. It's Dovin Nachman Golding, D N G. Ah. I started in high school. My friend Josh Kalowitz, uh, one day I, I was not feeling well, and they were running for election, geo elections of the school. And so he put up signs, he goes, vote ding. And that's how it, that's how that started. And the last question for Shia. What was the idea to turn Avram Fried's name, Avram Friedman, oh. into Fried? And why? Good question. So very simple. He did not want to. He didn't. That his idea was that he just wanted to sing solos on an album, not to make his own record. And I wanted him to do an album. And he said. And he said his mother doesn't let. You know, uh, he was still a bocher. And I said, so the pshara was he's going to call himself Avram Fried instead of Friedman and. Yeah. And nobody in Crown Heights, like when, when the album came out, was like, hey, what is this Freed business? You're Freed. They didn't know him. They, he did, they didn't know who this guy is. It's Freed. But he, he grew up in Crown Heights, though, right? Right. So, yeah. Nobody so, knew him. Interesting. Right. He, was one of, he was one of those people that we were talking about before, like me. When he started off in the music business, like, he had no idea what he was getting himself into. And, and he was, like, shy. And, like, he, she had told the first story at the time when he comes to the studio and he, he froze up. He goes, he goes, but then he became, he went from like being like so sh backstage to becoming so confident and so on the money and so, you know, taking care of like, any problems that would come up by a concert. He just knew, knows what to do and he's the best. I was at a concert that I was I'm seeing at probably four or five years ago and Avrema was on the thing and uh, we were watching rehearsal, uh, watching these singers saying, or this, or this, no, I don't get it, this microphone, that microphone. And Fremel gets up and he just and he goes, uh, he calls the engineer, what's your name? Okay. Uh, yeah. He calls him by his name. Just get a little bit more of Eber, a little more of this. He's done. Everybody else is taking 45 minutes. He goes, he goes to his room, he says it to him, he puts his, uh, his stock in his pushka. He is for sure one of the sweetest, most real people I, I've ever met in the industry. Unbelievable. So I'd like to thank our guests, Isra Alam, Dean Golding, and Shia Mendelowitz. Thanks to Amudim for supplying the access. I'm Yossi Zwag, and we'll see you at the next session of Off the Charts. Please head over to Unite to Heal and support Amudim and do what you can to help them continue their amazing work. We hope you enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you, Amudim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.